Well, turn in your Bible, your phone, your tablet, whatever you have, or in Paul's um, letter to the Romans, or in Romans chapter 11, we're going to look at verses 25 through 36. Uh, just a couple thoughts before we read the text. Number one, again, Paul is writing to Gentile Christians in the church. That's the audience here in chapter 11. And then the second thing, as I mentioned earlier, uh, chapter 11 ends the, the really the theological section of Paul's letter to the Romans. Chapters 1 through 11, the, the, the theology of, of Romans. In the next five or six months or so, however long it takes us, we'll be in chapters 12 through 16 looking at how should we live? Now that we know what to believe, what Paul has given us in Romans 1 through 11, how do we live? What the Bible calls ethics, morality. And, and the structure of Romans is really the structure of almost every one of Paul's letters, which is there is the guilt of the law, sin, there is the grace of God through Jesus Christ, and there is gratitude, our response to that, which is Romans 12 through 16. And so we'll, we'll look at that in the months ahead. Today is really the end of the theological section uh, in Romans, Romans chapter 11. Uh, we're going to look at verses 25 through 36. Paul writes, Lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words that the Apostle Paul wrote under the inspiration of your Holy Spirit 2,000 years ago. May your Holy Spirit speak to us now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. In the summer of 1934 in America, many Americans were anxious about a mystery, something that had not been solved. They were waiting for some big news to be revealed. They wanted the most wanted man in America to be captured. And for months and months in the summer of 1934, the most wanted man in America had not been captured. And everyone wanted this mystery solved. They wanted the big news to be revealed on what they used to call newspapers in America, printed on newspapers. That most wanted man was, was a bank robber, uh, a guy who killed some people, had a gang. His name was John Dillinger. And so the feds came up with a plan. We've got to find this guy. We've got to get rid of John Dillinger. He's the most wanted man in America. He had escaped from prison. He was on the run. He had escaped from a prison in Indiana. And so they tracked him down to, I think it was a bar, their first attempt, first failed attempt, was at a bar, I think it was somewhere in Indiana. And they located him and thought he was in there, and so they raided the bar in Indiana, and they captured his girlfriend. What the feds didn't realize was that outside in a car staring at the bar was John Dillinger, and he had watched a bunch of clumsy, odd-looking guys in dark suits surround the bar for a while, and he said, I'm not going in there. Those are feds, right? And so he drove off. They got his girlfriend. Right. A few weeks later, they got another tip. We found him. He's at a, he's at a waterfront, a lakefront resort in Wisconsin. So they, they marshaled their forces, and they went up to this lake resort to get the most wanted man in America. This is the summer of 34. And so they surrounded, at like 2, 3 a.m., they surrounded this resort to get John Dillinger. And then they went in after him, you know, shooting guns, blazing, all that kind of stuff that you'd see in, you know, early American movies of, of mobs and gangs and stuff. They didn't shoot him, but they did shoot an innocent bystander who, who was there working at the resort. It's the first recorded instance of an innocent person being killed by a federal agent. Meanwhile, John Dillinger fled out the back 
to the lake and disappeared. They, they couldn't find him. They captured people inside the resort or tried to, and then they faced a guy you may have heard of called Babyface Nelson, who had a machine gun and was defending Dillinger from the front of the resort as Dillinger ran out the back. And so the mystery continued. When would they get this guy? The Americans wanted to know, when is he going to be captured? There's this mystery. When will the news be printed that we found the most wanted man in America, John Dillinger? Well, finally, they got a tip, another tip, um, from a woman who ran a brothel in Chicago. And some of you may know this story that John Dillinger was staying in the brothel in Chicago. He'd held up a number of banks since then. He was making some pretty good money, pretty good business model if you can get away with it, not get caught by the law. He was doing well financially, staying at this brothel in Chicago. And so some of you know the story. They, the, the feds camped outside this, this theater, and inside John Dillinger was watching a Clark Gable movie, uh, film, I guess you'd call it, back in 1934. And when he came out, they rushed him, shot him, killed him in the streets of Chicago. The most wanted man in America was finally captured. They finally killed him. He was finally done. His career of bank robbery and, and mayhem and violence was over in July of 1934. Well, for many Americans, millions of Americans, the big news finally hit the newspapers. The mystery was solved. They found him. They've been looking for him for months. The mystery was solved. The news was fit to print. They had solved it. And now the papers of America were filled with the headline, Dillinger killed in Chicago outside the Biograph Theater in July of 34. Big news hit America. As we think about Romans 11, that's really the, the, the theme, the opening theme of what Paul is saying. He's saying, I'm going to reveal something big to you. A mystery has been given to me, the, 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 the mystery has been revealed and given to me, and I'm going to tell it to you. I'm going to put into print the news of what God is doing because you didn't know it before. That's what Paul is saying. Look at verse 25. He says, I want you to understand this mystery. I'm telling you something, he says, that you did not know before. Twenty times the Apostle Paul in his writings will use that word mystery. It only occurs once in the Gospels. Paul uses this word because he's been instructed to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He knows things that we need to know, things that God has given him. So he says, I'm revealing big news to you. Print this. Put this in the newspapers. Read it. And what is that mystery? The mystery is this. It's the mystery of God's plan of redemption. It's a three-step plan that Paul is talking about. He's saying, number one, the gospel went to the people of Israel, the Jews. They rejected it, by and large. Some, some received it but many didn't. And so what did God do? The second step, the, the gospel then went to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles broadly, generally started to receive it and respond in faith and repentance to the gospel preached. The third step in that plan is God's now going to use the reception of the Gentiles, receiving the gospel. He's going to use that to make the, the, the people of Israel, the Jewish men and women, jealous, and then they're going to come to faith in Christ through the Gentiles. That's the three-step plan. And Paul says, I'm revealing this because God has told me this, and you need to know the big news of what God is doing, his plan of redemption. And so why is, why is Paul revealing this? Because remember, he's writing to the Gentiles here, Gentile Christians in Rome. He's writing it so that the Gentile Christians remain humble, so that the Gentile Christians don't think, you know what, the gospel's come to us. We're from Egypt, we're from Rome, we're from Spain. He's going to go to Spain, or he wants to go to Spain later. We're from these different countries, and we're receiving it. People of Israel have not, so maybe, maybe there's something inherently good in us that we've received it, and God likes us. That temptation we talked about last week, temptation to spiritual pride, to think, yeah, I'm, I'm probably a little bit, just a little bit morally or spiritually superior to others. That temptation creeps in. We think about that for ourselves. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, I want you to remain humble. Look at verse 25. He says, lest you be wise in your own conceit. He says, I don't want you to be conceited or think that there's something special about you and that you've received it because you're better than them. That's why I'm revealing the, the news of salvation. Stay humble. God has a plan to redeem Jews and Gentiles, and he's revealing that plan. As, be, before we get into the, the, the meat of the text here. I want to spend two minutes on, on two words that if, as you read this, you may think, what is, what is Paul saying here? What is the Apostle Paul saying? Because he said, 
I'm going to use the Gentiles to share the gospel so that all Israel might be saved. So I want to spend two minutes on those two words, all Israel, because that's, if, 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 let me just say this, if you went to seminary and you don't need to, you, you would read books and volumes on those two words. What does that mean? What does all Israel mean? Does it mean that every single Israelite ever is going to come to faith in Christ? Is that what it means? Does it mean the state of Israel today is coming to faith in Christ? Or is it, as some um, reformer, someone like even John Calvin said, this is referring to Jews and Gentiles, spiritual Israel. Is that what it's saying? Because Paul uses that language in Galatians 6. If you read Galatians 6, he talks about Israel in a spiritual sense. So what is Paul saying here? I just say there's a lot of disagreement, so it's hard to say. Here's what I think he's saying, and so that we understand the meaning of the text here. I think what Paul is saying is this. All Israel. The context is key. From, Gen- from Romans 9 through Romans 11, Paul uses the word, up until this time, uses the word Israel ten times. Every single time, it's referring to ethnic Jews, men and women. So I think that's the context. He's referring to ethnic Jews, men and women. Paul had no conception. The Apostle Paul had no conception of the state of Israel as we know it today. That's, that's off the books. That's not even an option to interpret it. So what does it mean? Well, look at verse 25. Verse 25 talks about the fullness of the Gentiles coming to faith in Jesus Christ. If you're a Gentile this morning, I am. That, that means you. The fullness of the Gentiles means all of the Gentiles throughout history that are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. People like me. Maybe people like you. And so when Paul says all of Israel, all Israel, those two words, I believe that's a parallel statement to the fullness of the Gentiles means the fullness of Israel. Meaning all of the elect Jewish men and women throughout history that will come to faith in Jesus Christ. Throughout history. So all Israel, as I interpret it, parallels the fullness of the Gentiles throughout history, parallels all Israel throughout history. That's how I look at it. And, and one reason, another reason I say that, besides the context, is this. Look at this reference here from Isaiah 59. It's a combination of Isaiah 59 and Isaiah 27 in, in your Bible. He says, the deliverer will come from Zion, that, that text. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and they will be by covenant with them when I take away their sins. What does that refer to? It's from Isaiah 59 and Isaiah 27, maybe an allusion to Jeremiah 31, the new covenant. But it's primarily Isaiah 59 and 27. It means when Christ comes to Zion and dies, he's going to banish sin and ungodliness. He's going to deal with it at the cross. It's, the reference here from the Apostle Paul is not to a second coming of Christ to return. It's to his first coming, his first appearance, where he comes in humility to die for your sins, to offer his life as a sacrifice for your life, to pay the penalty that you should pay for sin. He does it. So the elect of Israel is saved as a result of Christ's first coming, his first appearance. Throughout history, people come to faith by looking to the work of Christ on the cross. And so the the all Israel means the elect of Israel throughout history. And there could be be a predominance at the end of time. That, That could be. Some commentators like that interpretation. There's going to be a mass conversion. It's possible. There's just no... For my opinion, there's no textual indicators here to say it's going to be at the very end of time. It's fine to believe that. There's just not enough textual evidence to suggest that. Uh, A theologian from the last century, uh, Herman Bavink, said this on this text. Reformed theologian said, All Israel is the full number which during the course of the centuries is gathered out of Israel to the Lord. Louis Burkhoff, a theologian from the last century. I like theologians from the last century. Um, He said this, Burkhoff said this, All Israel is not the whole nation of Israel, but the whole number of elect drawn out of the covenant people of God. And so, all Israel just means the fullness of the Gentiles throughout time will come to the Lord through faith because of the work of Christ, His first coming. All of Israel means the elect of Israel. Those people that are ethnic Jews will come to faith in Christ throughout time. That's what that means. So, Before we move on, let's just stop for a second and make sure we understand what we're seeing here. Paul is saying, I'm revealing a mystery, something you didn't know. It's big news. The Jews rejected Christ, generally speaking. The Gentiles are receiving it. God's going to use that to share the gospel with the Jews and that they will come to faith in him through their jealousy of the Gentiles. That's what he's revealing. 
It's a mystery now revealed. And I think one reason Paul is saying you need to know this is because I think there was a broad misconception in the, in, amongst Jews going back to the Old Testament, the Hebrews, that at the very end of time in, in history, then many Gentiles would come to the Lord. And the reason I say that is there's several texts that you might read that way in the Old Testament. If you, if you write in your Bibles, write Micah chapter 4. In Micah chapter 4, written 700 years before the birth of Christ, Micah 4 says this, In the latter days the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established, and the peoples will flow to it, and many nations will come to the house of the Lord. That's Micah 4. And so it's easy, before the coming of Christ, before the New Testament is written, the canon is, is closed in the New Testament, it's easy to read that and say, Okay, it's going to happen at the end. The Gentiles are going to flow in at the very end. Paul is saying, no, that's not true. Gentiles are flowing in. The end is here with the first coming of Christ. We're living in the final days, as the Apostle Paul will say. So he's correcting maybe a misconception that Jewish Christians might have had that at the end the Gentiles will come in. He's saying, no, it's happening now. And that's a good thing. You think of the passage in, in, at the end of Revelation that the, the kings of the nations will walk in before the Lord. That's happening. The gospel is going out. The last thought before we move on, I want to make sure we understand what's happening here in the text. The last thought before we move on is this. In Romans 11, Paul is addressing the Gentiles to say, don't take pride in your accomplishments. Don't take pride in what's happening, specifically to the Gentiles. Don't take pride in it. Romans 11, rather, parallels Romans chapter 2. Romans 11 parallels Romans 2. In Romans 2, what did the Apostle Paul say? He addressed the Jews and said, don't take pride in your history. You had Moses, great. You had the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that's great. You had David, mostly good. You had all those things. You had the Ten Commandments. You had all those things. Don't take pride in it. So Romans 11 parallels Romans 2. Romans 11 says Gentiles don't have pride. Romans 2 says Jews don't have pride. The only thing you can boast about is the mercy of God demonstrated in Jesus Christ for you. Because God sent His Son to die for you. You did not deserve it. I did not deserve it. I will never pay God back for that. You will never pay God back for that. Fully. That's what Gary was talking about, 930, stewardship. Our, stewardship is just a response giving back my life. I can never really pay you back, but I'm going to do my best to honor you. That's what Paul is saying. Romans 2 and Romans 11 are parallel statements. Look to the grace of God. Know that you have no opportunities for pride in your life. Boast in what God has done for you. About four or five weeks ago, there was a a dramatic story out of the the Daytona, Florida area. There was a five-year-old autistic boy um, who was nonverbal who had gone missing one night. His parents had gone upstairs and he had fled out the window one night. And so they called local authorities. They let the neighbors know that, hey, our son, he's he's nonverbal. He has some issues, some challenges, some problems. He's gone missing, and so we need everyone to go search. And so law enforcement showed up, neighbors showed up, and and one of the the men that showed up started looking in the woods, kind of a swampy area, it's Florida, behind their house looking for this nonverbal child, saying, how are we going to find this kid? Like, it's it's getting dark. How are we going to find this kid? So he goes in and... Eventually, he locates the kid. The kid is in the swamp, and he's holding on to a log in the swamp trying to survive. And the, the man, out of the kindness, the boldness, the courage of his heart, goes into the swamp and grabs the kid off the log and saves him and rescues him and brings him back to his parents and saved this five-year-old boy. Otherwise, he would have drowned if he'd been out there too long. He would, he would not have been able to hold on for too long. And so this man goes in there, and the kindness, the boldness, the courage of his heart saves this boy outside of Daytona, Florida. That's a a picture of what we see in verse 33, where it talks about the riches of God, the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. The riches of God, that's his kindness towards you. His kindness towards you. Like the Florida man who he wants to save this kid. He goes and finds him and brings the kid out of the swamp. That's what God does for you. That's the kindness of God for you, to come and save you, to redeem you, to rescue you. You did not go and find God. He went and found you. We're going to go back two centuries. The 19th century theologian A.A. Hodge said, every Christian is a Calvinist in their heart. 
They, and what that means is they know that God saved them. God did the work. Forget the Calvinist language. It just means God's sovereignty and salvation. Every Christian knows that. We read a story like the story from Florida, and we like to associate with the man who went in the swamp and saved a kid. I'm like, well, that's probably what I would do. I'm the hero of that story, right? Maybe that's how you would read that story. I, I would do that. I'm the hero. No, in those stories, you and I are like the five-year-old nonverbal kid in the swamp who needs to be rescued, and that's what God does. He comes to you in the swamp of your life, sin and death, and rescues you. You're not the guy that goes and saves. God's the guy that goes and saves. That's the kindness, the riches of God demonstrated to you. Because as as Paul says here, look at verse 32. You had no hope, you had no future, you were facing spiritual death. He says in verse 32, God has consigned all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. That word consigned, you could translate that imprisoned. Imprisoned. Look, if you think about Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul's very first letter, he uses this word twice. He says, you were imprisoned to sin, you were imprisoned to the law. Here, the Apostle Paul in Romans, several years later after Galatians was written, says, you are in the prison of rebellion against God. You don't escape prison. Someone has to come in there with the key and open the door and let you out. That's what God does. That's His kindness. He comes to you and lets you out of the prison of of sin, the prison of death, of rebellion against Him. He comes to you, He finds you, He rescues you, just like that man in Florida did for that nonverbal five-year-old. He does it because he is merciful to his people. That's the depths of his kindness. It's infinite. You'll never pay him back for it. You can live in response to it, though. That's his, his kindness to you. Then Paul says two other things. He says the depths of his riches, I, I interpret that as kindness. Then he says the two other things, God's wisdom and knowledge. So God is infinitely kind to you, and he has infinite knowledge and wisdom. Let me ask you this. I want you to think about this for a second. How do you gain wisdom in your life? How do you gain wisdom in your life? And that presupposes that you want wisdom in your life. How do you gain it? How do you gain wisdom in your life? Second question. How do you gain knowledge in your life? Information, data, stuff. Well, with wisdom, I mean... You might ask someone who's been there before. You might ask someone who's got some experience. He's been down this road before. I'm I'm meeting with a pastor who was my mentor years ago. I'm meeting with him in a few weeks just to gain some wisdom from him. He's been down this road before. And there are challenges that pastors have that you have to address. So I need some wisdom. You might ask someone who is older, someone who's been down that road before. You also gain wisdom over time. Right? You experience things and gain wisdom. How do you gain knowledge? Well, you study, you read books, hopefully. Do we still have books? I guess we have books. Maybe not printed books, but we read, we study, we go to school, we learn things, right? And so all we, for us, all wisdom and knowledge comes from other people and through time. Other people either in writing or in person. That's true for every person in the universe but God. God's never needed more time just to figure things out and to gain some wisdom. God's never had to go ask for help. God's never had to to study a book and learn up on a topic, right? He's never needed advice, counsel, information, knowledge about how to help you in your life from anyone. He doesn't need your help. He definitely doesn't need my help, right? He has all wisdom, all knowledge. That's what Paul is saying here. God has never asked the counsel of someone else. He's never asked for the input of somebody else. He doesn't need it. God is actually the source of all wisdom, the source of all knowledge. It rests in Him. It resides in Him. If you want wisdom, you go to the Lord. He has it. God has never lacked in wisdom or in knowledge. He is infinite, eternal, unchangeable. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the Alpha, the Omega. He's not limited in His resources to provide for you. God's the only being who has infinite knowledge and wisdom, and he demonstrates that. He demonstrates that in his plan of redemption to redeem you, to say you were lost, but now you're mine, and I'm going to do it through sending my son to die on the cross for your sins, to to pay the penalty for you so that you might have a life with me forever, that you might be adopted into my family, 
That's the infinite kindness, the knowledge, the wisdom of God. He sends the Son to the cross to die for you. Christ dies, rises again for your justification so that you might be declared right with God based on what Christ has done, not what you can do. That's the wisdom, the knowledge, the kindness of God. This past summer, we, you know, we took our uh, vacation. We went out west and we were traveling. And one of the unforgettable moments of our trip, which we weren't expecting, was we were traveling out and we, we camped out in a large national forest. Um, this was not a memory we planned to make or expected to make, but I think we can laugh about it now. Um, we can laugh about it now, it's true. We were, we were camping out, so we had a tent set up. There's a little bit, a little bit of some bugs. We had a campfire going, and we were enjoying it. We're, you know, we're traveling out west. We're going to go out to Yellowstone, Grand Tetons, all that kind of stuff. So we had the tent set up. We had the fire going. It was great, and it started to rain a little bit. So we thought, yeah, it's getting late. We'll just get in the tent and kind of get the better early. We've got a big day of driving, driving west all day. We got in the tent, and um, it wasn't just a light shower. We were surrounded by trees. We're in the middle of nowhere. It wasn't a light shower. It was one of the heaviest thunderstorms we've ever been through. We're in a little two-person tent in the middle of nowhere. And it's a reminder of the power of nature when you're in a little tent and lightning and thunder is all around you and you're surrounded by trees and you realize we're kind of the weak link here, right? Like we're the, we're the weak people here. Like we, we got to get through this. And so there's lightning, it's, I mean, and the thunder is just all around us, I mean, just kind of shaking us. And it leads to a sense of awe and wonder about the power of creation. It also leads you to a sense of some questions, right? I think the, one of the first questions I had was about 1 or 2 a.m., which was, do you think we should just go find a hotel? That was the first question. The second question I didn't really ask Emily, but I thought to myself was, will a tree fall on our tent? had that thought because there was that one time where the, you know, it was pretty bad. The other question was, when will we ever get to sleep? Because not only is it not dark because of the constant lightning, I mean, this was a heavy summer thunderstorm, but it was so loud. And so we saw the power of nature, the wonder of nature, which kept us up most of the night, but also led to questions. We had a lot of questions in the midst of that storm. That's what we see here in the, in the final verses of our text. Paul has showed us the power of God and the plan of redemption. It leads us to awe. It leads us to wonder at God's power. It also leads to questions that we might have. And in order for the Apostle Paul to deal with our questions, he submits some questions to you, to his audience, to the people listening. He submits questions to you to humble us and to exalt God. Here's the questions. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who's, known his, who's been his counselor? Both of those are from Isaiah 40, verse 13. Who's known God's mind? Have you known it? Has God come to you and said, hey, hey Ben, I need some counsel here? No. That's the last thing he's going to do. Third question, who has given a gift to God that he might be repaid? That's, that goes back to Job 41. Remember Job, the story of Job? Rich man, God removes everything but his health. And Job has questions. He has some poor friends <laughs> that don't help. And at the end of it, Job's wanting some answers from God. And God says, why don't you listen for a little bit, Job? I've got questions for you. Where were you when I founded the universe? Did I ask your opinion on that, Job? Job, you should listen more. That's where this is from. Job, have you given me anything that I owe you? These are the questions that, that Paul gives to us as we sense the awe and the wonder of God's powerful plan of redemption. He gives us these questions. Who are, who are you and I to give God advice? on his plan of redemption. When has God needed our counsel? When has God needed us to step in and help him? What, what do we owe? What does God owe us? Nothing. He doesn't have to give us anything. Everything we have is grace given to us freely. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us. And these questions are not to beat us up. They're to humble us and to exalt God so that we trust Him more and realize we trust in our own understanding, our own wisdom, our own knowledge too much. And we should trust in His. When we think about these questions, as, as Paul finishes up Romans 11, again, he's finishing up his, his theology of Romans. We think about the power of God. He doesn't need my help. He doesn't need my counsel. 
He doesn't owe me anything. That should lead you to worship because you realize the power of God, the wisdom of God. It should lead you to glorify God. And that's what Paul does here. This final verse is a doxology, the final verse of Romans 11. Doxology just means a word of glory. Doxa in Greek means glory. Logos means word. Doxology is a word of glory to God. For from him and through him and to him are all things. He gets the glory for everything. Your redemption is from God, the Father. It's his plan. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. It is through the work of Jesus Christ. And it is applied to you by the Holy Spirit. He is the source of your salvation. He is the sustainer of your redemption. He is the the goal, the ultimate goal of your redemption is to be in his presence. It's not to have a happy life with health and finances all taken care of. That's not the goal of your redemption. All that will be gone one day. You'll be in his presence. That's the goal of it. It should lead us to worship. And that's what we celebrate as we come to the Lord's table this morning. We celebrate his work of redemption. Everything is from him. We're sustained through him. Everything goes back to him at the end of the day. Who has given a gift to God that he should be repaid? We've not given a gift. God has given the ultimate gift to you, the the life, the death of his son, Jesus Christ on the cross. We just repay him with gratitude, with worship. And that's what the Lord's Supper takes us to. It takes us to the death of Christ where we realize we have everything we need through the sacrificial death of Christ. And so think about that. Think about God's power, his greatness in the plan of salvation, the plan of redemption, the death of Christ. Think about that this morning as we come to the Lord's table. Let's pray.